Welcome back, Atlanta. I'm your host, Angel Yasmin. Thank you for tuning in each Thursday from 1 to 2 p.m. on the IBNX Radio Network on Next 411, Controlling the Narrative. And guys, I'm sorry we couldn't go live today because I'm not going to the radio station. I'm just going to protect other people and not be around people because I think that's a smart thing to do is work remotely from home. And I have a very special guest, Dr. Barbara Joy. How are you, sweetheart? I'm doing great, kind of. <laughs> well, pretty good. The best that I can do being on the front line of the pandemic. But overall, I'm doing pretty well. And thank you for asking. Oh, well, you know what? I just want to just go ahead and give this, give a shout out to you, first of all, and all the doctors and nurses and everybody that's in the healthcare field that's putting their life at risk every day to help people. So I really do appreciate what you do over and beyond for people. And God bless you. God bless your heart. I know it's a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I just want to get right to it. I mean, there's people are freaking out. They're freaking out all over the world. There's so many questions they want to know about COVID-19. And I just want to get to the bottom of it so we can kind of calm America down if we can. So tell me about this virus. Where, how are we advancing right now to this day? What's going on? Okay, so the reason why we have so much mania is because we're seeing in other countries like China and Italy, Italy right now in particular, I guess they were behind the curve and Mm -hmm. therefore it spread so much that now they are really trying to catch catch up and it's been very um, mortal. So really what's happening is that they are, from what I heard, the second oldest country in the world and a lot of them are smokers and um wow. and a, a lot of the elderly got it so there aren't enough ventilators and there aren't enough icu beds and so what they're having to do is choose between two people so it is coming to a point where if you're over 60 they're not doing cpr and they're not they're not giving you a bed they just let you pass away because they're trying to save the 30 40 and 50 year olds that have a longer time period of living. So we're choosing between two people that should live only because the time period that they're getting sick is at this, you know, peak. You oh, get what I'm saying? Oh, yes. So, and that's what we're trying to do to prevent here. My personal opinion is that we, we probably are behind it and there are probably so many people that have it. Per one person who has tested positive for it, I'm sure that five or six people have it because it's so contagious. Mm. Um, And if we talk about how it is transmitted, it's transmitted in three ways. So the first way is through respiratory droplets. So that would be when somebody coughs or sneezes and um, they have it on their hands or they touch you or they touch a surface that you touch the surface or surface or touch them, or let's just say some somebody picks up a piece of tissue that you blew your nose in then they have access to it Hmm. and then what will happen is that you inoculate yourself so that means like in a mucous membrane your eyes your nose and your mouth that you touch yourself or that it goes there the second way is fecal oral so fecal is basically poop if somebody pooped and then they didn't wash their hands properly and then the same thing they touched you they touched the surface and you touched the surface and then you self-inoculate with with your in your eyes or your mucous membranes the third way which is why it is really so contagious is the um the that it's airborne so meaning if somebody coughs and you're within six feet of them Mm. then you have the possibility of inhaling it yourself right Mm -hmm. um and they're saying that it can stay airborne for up to three hours so somebody coughed and then you walk through those air droplets you inhale it and then you get it and you don't even know who gave it to you just because you walked into the air wow, which is why we're saying yeah which is why we're saying stay six feet away from people and quit coming together because it's for sure that if you're in close quarters with other people it's going to pass from this to the next to the next mm-hmm. so that's it's really it's highly highly um now, and I really want to get to the bottom of this um Dr. Barbara, because a lot of people are still out and about. I don't think they're taking this as serious as we need to. How serious should we take this? Should we just stay at home? Should we be out at all? Tell the I truth. Think that, I think that the pandemic in, a, in, a, in, in the U.S. will probably peak in about two to four weeks where we see the most um, 
load on the healthcare system and the most people pass away around that time period. And then if we continue doing self-quarantine, it'll go down after that. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that people should stay home. Um, the thought process also is that 80% of people, they will just have a mild cold and they'll get over it. The problem comes in that 15 to 20% of the patients that are at higher risk will get severe symptoms. Mm -hmm. So your chances of getting high severe symptoms is lower. But let's think about this. If what, I don't know the math, but what is 15% of 300 million people in the US? Mm. It's, it's a lot. It's we a lot. only have a little bit less than 7,000 ICU beds and ventilators. So how can you put basically a million people on 7,000 um, ventilators? Mm. We, we don't have enough. So what's gonna happen is doctors are gonna be forced to choose at a last minute's notice who lives and who dies just because we don't have the bed and we don't have the ventilator and that's not fair people are going to die they should live and that's why it's so serious i i think that people just because of themselves likely not getting sick that they um what will probably have to happen is somebody a first degree relative or somebody that's close to them or somebody that they know know somebody who passes away and then they may take it seriously wow. but by then you know i think it's already a little bit too late and we're trying to to catch up yeah and i read this quote that said we'll never know if we overreacted but we will for sure know if we underreacted mm. well you know i want to know why is it called the new novel coronavirus is that is this a new strand that started from the beginning yeah. So the coronavirus, um, if you think of a crown, you see that it has, um, if you look at the pictures that, that, that's circulating, they have little, basically like a crown. So corona, that's where the name comes from. Mm -hmm. MERS and SARS were a type of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. A virus is basically a protein. It can't live on its own. It has to be in another host. Hence the fact it was in animals and then passed to humans and now is human to human. Mm -hmm. But we have had coronaviruses. This is just a new one that we haven't seen before. Mm -hmm. So the reason why that's scary is because it's new when we don't know about it. We don't know, you know, we just figured out the three ways that it's transmitted. We, at this point, don't even know if it's seasonal. So the flu, wow. the flu is around. We think about it. You get your flu vaccine from November to April. Mm -hmm. For this new coronavirus, people don't know. Is this seasonal? Is this year round? We don't know what's going on. Right. And so we can only hope that when spring and summer comes and with warmer weather, that it will start to taper off. And that's the hope. And that's what we're praying for. Oh my gosh. Now tell us some of the symptoms that people may be experiencing so they can kind of, you know, see if they should take any treatments further or go further. When right. So fever is around 80 to 90% of the time. And then a cough, I've got a sore. I've heard of myalgias you know, where your, your bodies are achy. I've heard of some people having nausea and vomiting. Mm -hmm. um, but the biggest thing that we're worried about is the, that it becomes pneumonia. So that is inflammation of the lungs, making it more difficult to breathe. So we're trying to save the ICU beds and save the tests for those people that are having shortness of breath and difficulty breathing. Mm -hmm. So usually the triad is fever, mm -hmm. shortness of breath, and the cough like cough and then the shortness of breath. Yeah. Now, what if you're not showing any symptoms at all? What, I mean, it, do you do? What okay. are you taking to boost your immune system, basically? I tell my patients to take 1,000 milligrams of vitamin C two to three times a day. Okay. Vitamin D3, 5,000 international units a day. Mm -hmm. Zinc, 50 milligrams twice a day. Okay. Stay hydrated, tons of water, don't drink sugar, don't drink trash, but just drink tons mm -hmm. and tons of water. You might even be able to put some lemon or ginger or turmeric into a tea, herbal teas. Yes. So yes, hydration, um, good supplements, and nutritious food. Wow. And I want people to understand how important it is to eat nutritious food right now in this time of period to boost their immune system. Like, What do you think, how important that is to you? That is huge. Um, cause if, because the type of food you can eat, 
is either toxic and decreases your immune system mm -hmm. or improves your immune system. There is no neutral. Right. Maybe popcorn's neutral, but other than that, <laughs> you just want to make sure yes. that you are boosting your immune system and giving yourself energy and supplying yourself with the building blocks for your immune system to fight. Mm -hmm. How can your immune system fight if you haven't even given it the bricks to build the house? Exactly. To do what you need to. So it is really, really important. Along with meditation, prayer, yeah. um, relaxing, being around family members that aren't, you know, that aren't quarantined, or if you are quarantined, staying around family. I think one of the positive benefits of this whole pandemic is the fact that we are getting back to the nuclear family, and it is forcing us to eat lunch and dinner together and to do homework together, parents with their kids, yeah. digital learning, and getting back to that part of it, the actual true interaction being forced to do that. So... <laughs> That's the good yeah. news about it. I mean, families are getting back together, but let's just be real about that. I'm seeing that families are, you know, visiting each other because I really want to go see my family. Is that safe? Right. Now? I think at, I think at this point it's time to just chill out and right. stay in your own home. Okay. We're in the comfort of your own bed and and basically do the FaceTime thing. Zoom them, <laughs> FaceTime them, Skype them and wait until maybe four to six weeks before things kind of died down before mm -hmm. you do that. Because there, there are so many things that people are at risk. Mm -hmm. Meaning, the way that the virus gets into your body is through the ACE2 receptors in your lungs. Mm -hmm. So anybody with asthma, which is common in people even younger, you know, 20s, 30s, 40s, they're more at risk. Yes. We think about people who have COPD, they're at risk. Mm -hmm. And then HIV, um, HIV and chemotherapy patients, cancer patients that have decreased immune system. A lot of women have autoimmune disease where they're on biologics or steroids that decrease their immune system. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, um, I say that because I just, I see so many people getting together and gathering around and letting their families come over and friends come over. And I'm like, whoa, you know, I don't want to be, I don't want to offend anyone. But at the same time, I just want to make sure that we're being smart about everything. I don't want us to be like, oh, you know, it's okay. It's okay. I don't feel anything. I don't have any symptoms. And that's my family. So really psychologically, you're not loving them. You're not giving them unconditional love because you're not trying to protect them. Even though you right. may have symptoms, I want the world to know that you are still able and susceptible of carrying on this pandemic. Right. You know, so I just, I had to, I had to hone in on that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people, I'm looking at social media, I'm like, oh man, why are y'all doing this? Why are you doing that? And especially with churches. Let's talk about that because yeah. I think they get away with a lot because again, I'm a very spiritual person, Dr. Barbara. You, you know me, I'm very spiritual. But at the same time, I think it's time to be wise. Talk about that. Right. So I agree with you that I am mm -hmm. seeing a lot of people say, I'm not going to live in fear. But it's not about being in fear. It's about being smart. It has nothing to do with fear. Yeah, right. It has nothing to do with fear and everything to do with just being a smart person and a good person. Absolutely. That even if you are the one who's the 80% who will just have a mild cold, that you're protecting the, the, the 20% that are more risk that have the possibility of losing their lives. Mm. And here's the thing. If the curve was flattened and the same people of 20% who are going to get get sick over a longer period of time was going to happen uh -huh. we would have the capability of getting these group of people in get them saved there is no cure all we need to do is support their body symptomatically until their body's immune system fights it get them out of the hospital get the new people in if that was the case great but what's happening because everybody is just walking around and we're kind of behind everything yeah. is that the medical system will be hit in a very, very strong two to three, two to four weeks of nonstop sickness where we really do have to choose who lives and who dies. It'll be complete chaos. Oh my God. Um, and they are already, from what I hear from my colleagues, usually if you have a medical license in one state, you can't practice in other states. But mm -hmm. since there are deficiencies in physicians and physicians are dropping too because we don't have protective equipment, Mm -hmm. They are, they obliterated those lines and a physician can practice anywhere if needed. I also just, you know, I told you this earlier, I was asked by my hospital just to make sure 
if I needed to come into the ER or into inpatient service to, yeah. to do some work and be pulled into the front lines in that way, I'm family medicine outpatient, the front line here, but um, they asked if I would be available to do that. And, and I agreed that if, that if, if needed, it is my due diligence to, to come and help with the shift and take over for some of my colleagues. Now, how are you protecting yourself? A lot of doctors are coming up with this as well, right? And I just, right. are you quarantining yourself mm -hmm. from everybody, your loved ones? How are you keeping yourself up? Or what did, you know? So I am, I am single with no children and I told my boyfriend to stay home. So I haven't seen him since we started this whole craziness, but we're FaceTiming a couple times a day. Um, I am in clinic, but we've locked the doors. So my, my staff, my manager and my medical assistants and everybody is here, mm -hmm. but we are doing patient care virtually. So meaning if you had a pap smear or an annual exam where you would come in and I would do a physical, mm -hmm. those are canceled and rescheduled for, you know, maybe three months from now mm -hmm. because it's not urgent, right? Mm -hmm. If you have chronic conditions like diabetes, I am doing that over the phone where I basically ask you how you're doing, what your numbers are, and then we go up or down on medicine or talk about lifestyle. If you have an acute ailment like a broken finger or, or something, you know, a stomach ache, that is telemedicine as well. And if somebody is truly sick enough, I'm getting a lot of COVID-19 questions. That'll be telemedicine and I direct them on if they are a candidate to get testing Mm -hmm. or if they should just go to the ER. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, I know, have you, well, first of all, have you heard any rumors about a vaccine coming soon? Um, of course, they're trying to quicken that, mm -hmm. um, and they are testing it without going through certain trials on human beings. But I would say the soonest that usually they come out with a vaccine, it, for it to be safe, that you would want to inoculate, you know, the entire country would be 18 months. In my opinion, from what I know in medicine, it's going to take 18 months to basically trial it and make sure that it's safe to give to everyone. And you have to look at do no harm first. What if the vaccine that we're trying to cure 100% of people, that it causes, you know, 30 to 40% of the time it causes an issue? Well, then that's no point because we're only really trying to save the 15 to 20%, the 80% were okay in the first place, and now we actually made them sick with the side mm -hmm. effect. So first, do no harm. Um, I think, you know, they are in the works of it, but in my opinion, by the time it's available for use and it's safe, mm -hmm. um, we'll probably be over this particular haul of the virus. Wow. Now, yeah, so to yeah. be determined, yeah. Right. Well, we're praying for that. Woo! Speedy. Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> so what's the average death rate so far as of today? Um, I, I think the death rate, okay, so they're saying that if you go into the hospital and you need hospitalization, that probably about 30 to 40 percent. If you yourself needed a ventilator, 50 percent of those patients pass away. And then there's something called ECMO. I forgot what that really stands for, but basically you're so bad that you need more than a ventilator to stay alive. 100% of those patients pass away. Mm. Yeah. Well, how close is this virus close to the flu? Is it, is it similar? Very similar? Or how can we I would say it would be, I would say what is similar is the fact that um, it's communicable and that you get similar symptoms, mm -hmm. except flu rarely goes into pneumonia. Hmm. So what I am seeing is, um, th th here's the difference also. When is the flu, we have a vaccine for it. Number two is, if you're hit by the flu, you are down and out hit by an 18 wheeler within 24 mm -hmm. hours. Mm -hmm. You know you have the flu. Mm -hmm. That's what makes this different. People can walk around with symptoms for two to 14 days before even exhibiting symptoms. And that whole two to 14 days, they're out and about spreading it. Wow. Because you don't know. So 24 hours of knowing tells you, hey, I need to stay inside and I need to take care of myself and quarantine myself until my flu goes away. Mm. This thing you could have, like I said, walk through those respiratory, you know, air droplets, inhale it, incubate it. 
for two to 14 days and maybe not even get a fever until day eight. But by then you had an entire week of passing it on. Is it okay? So there are like stages to this virus because we saw how China kind of fell apart. We saw Italy fall apart. Will we be going? Are we actually trying? Let me let me let me see this. Are we actually trying to stop the process from getting like that, or is it a way that we can stop it? Are we doing enough? Do you think? I think that I think that we're trying, but since the entire country is not on quarantine because it's a statewide or citywide mandate that we're getting versus federal. Mm. I think that we can lessen it a little bit thus far with what we're doing, but I think what's happening is our numbers are mimicking Italy's, and from them having it first, we're basically trying to learn from them to mitigate it as best we can, but we, we likely are heading into, you know, healthcare crisis within the next two to four, two, two to four weeks. Yeah. That's unbelievable. I, I just, I just really, you know, that makes me sad. It makes me like question our system. Like, why are they not trying to protect us? And they say, oh, we don't want to spook the people, but we're already spooked. We're already on the inside. We're already kind of following protocol and guidelines that they asked us to do. But I just don't understand. Why do you think they're not putting the country on lockdown so far? If they know they can, if that's the way to kind of decease it. I just think that there's so many different thought processes. We're also thinking about economy. And yeah. so there's finances. There is socioeconomics. So some people who, who really can't have food or won't have a way to pay bills. There's, there's finances. There's socioeconomics. There's so many things that are fighting. And what I do think that the, that the federal government should have basically from the top down made mandates so that everybody can follow suit versus it being variable. If you live in this county, it's different from that county. Right. So I know that in Atlanta, we were just told, you know, there's a curfew in gyms and restaurants and all those things are, are shut down. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's different for my family that lives only two hours south in middle Georgia and more Robbins. Wow. It just depends. Mm. So if somebody gets infected, what drugs do you recommend someone taking if they need to, if it gets that bad? Um, I don't think you should take any drugs, although there are some doctors that are practicing with certain things like Plaquenil that's supposed to decrease the viral rep replication, and that is an autoimmune um, disorder drug, Plaquenil. Okay. Um, but at this point, I think the best thing to do is, since there is no cure, is to basically strengthen your immune system and do things that strengthen the immune system so that you can fight the symptoms and fight the virus, because yeah. that's really what's happening is the 80% that have the cold-like symptoms, they support their body or their immune systems are strong enough to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And then even the people who go on the ventilator, we're just trying to support their body symptomatically mm -hmm. until their body fights it itself. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. so let, me ask, let me ask this question. Um, what about um, the mask? Are you guys, do you guys have supplies now? Are you guys getting all those things? Are you, you know, protecting yourself within the hospital? And if somebody needs to go to the hospital, what's the protocol for that? Um, from what I'm hearing from my colleagues across the nation, we don't have enough personal protective gear. Yeah. It's, it's pretty difficult because in the so many ways that, you're, that it is spread, you would basically need an eye shield because you don't want the mucous membrane of your eyes mm -hmm. getting the droplets. You would need an N95 fit mask, which are the ones, not the surgical mask that you see people wearing, but the actual mask that can protect little droplets from com coming around to your face so that you don't get it in your mouth or your nose. Mm -hmm. um, so that, and then also to cover, because we're seeing that um, when the respiratory droplets get on your clothes, it can last on your clothes for a while. Right. So no, we, that is an emergency right now is that our, frontline providers, our doctors and our nurses and our medical assistants and, and everybody don't have enough protective gear. So they're falling as well. They're getting sick and dying as well. And the reason, and we were trying to figure out why would someone in healthcare have a worse prognosis than everybody else? And I'm thinking viral load. If you've been exposed to the COVID virus over and over and over and over again with your patients, the amount of virus that you get in your body to fight off is much more, is my thought. Yeah. That's my theory. 
So wow. no, we don't have enough. Um, most everything, the test kits and even our protective gear is in, you know, was produced in China. So now we're rushing to find places to manufacture them here in America and get them. And it's, it's not fast enough. So people are reusing masks, but that's even not safe because if you reuse a mask and you got droplets on it, you go to the next patient who may not have it. And now you're the vector who gave it to them. Wow. Oh my God. And then we have families ourselves. Well, let me just ask you this on a scale of one to 10, how dangerous is this virus? If you could put it on a scale from one to 10, what, what would it be? The first thing that comes to mind would be like a six to a seven, only okay. considering I'm considering though how much the 80% is versus the 15%. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I, I would think it's a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. If you are one of those cancer, HIV, asthma, COPD, elderly with multiple like high blood pressure and diabetes, you are more at risk than most. Wow. And you, it will take much longer for your body to fight off and you are at more, more risk. So. And I just, you know, I think a lot of people are, I'm looking at the comments on social media. A lot of people are just so concerned about, you know, the country not being on lockdown and why are we not doing it sooner? But do you think that they should be worried about money right now and not just people's livelihoods and just being alive? <laughs> what about that? No, I do think that we should care about livelihood. Um, but urgently, if you don't have any family members and you feel well, why the thought process is, why can't I pay my bills and keep my lights on and drive my car and put gas in my car or like take care of my child? That's why there's back and forth. And yeah. you have to get it. People who do not have safety, that don't have a nest egg, that don't have family members, to them, they would rather risk their life and possibly get the virus and be that 80% that gets better and possibly be a vector and pass it as long as they can do nails or hair or, or be a waiter or waitress or do things that they have to really have people interaction and customers in order to live. So mm -hmm. that's more urgent for them is I need to pay my bills. I need to keep my lights on. I need clean water to drink and food to eat myself. I need to take care of my children. So right. that's why it's been very difficult to be in that position, which is very real for Americans, and then not know if there's a bailout or what will happen tomorrow. Wow. Well, it's scary. I, it is scary. And financially I, and health wise. Cool. Yeah, I know. I what I'm my main concern is that people will be stigmatized. And that is something that I do not want to happen because a lot of people are saying, oh, well, you know, I have a, a, a very, you know, not a good immune system or whatever the case may be. And that's what they're putting out there in the media that, you know, if you don't have a good immune system and you end up getting it. Do you think the popularity will be, population, sorry, popularity, population will be stigmatized by that? Would it cause, you know, some strength? Um, I, I think you can't help that just because of society and social media. Yeah. But I think what is being really, really helpful is the fact that someone like Tom Hanks and Idris Elba, who have been positive, have come forth and said, hey, this is this, this is how me and my wife, this is how we're doing. Idris Elba, his wife, Sabrina, you know, came and became quarantined with him. So it just shows that it doesn't choose celebrities or rich or, Black or white. Yes, black people can get crushed. Let's talk this. about that. Because <laughs> they had that whole myth that yeah. people stop thinking that. That is not true. It's far from the truth. So let's be smart here. Um, 100% of people can be at risk for the coronavirus. Yes. <laughs> you are, you, 100% of people, if exposed, will get the coronavirus. It's just that we want to protect that 15 to 20% that have the possibility of passing away from it. So what are we That's looking we're like trying on this, the, the test? Do y'all have tests at the hospitals now that people can actually get tested now or have they ran out? What's going on? So here's one of the problems is that we do have commercial labs that you've heard of like Quest or LabCorp that do test for COVID-19. Yeah. But just because they have the capability and ability to test for it doesn't mean we have the test kits. So when I say a test kit, I mean a swab that can go into the nasal cavity behind 
like deep in the nose from the back of the throat. That's oropharyngeal or nasopharyngeal. That's mm. how the swab, the test kit that actually gets the swab so that we can go and test it at the lab. The lab will test as many as we have. We just don't have enough test kits. Wow. So there's 109 million test kits that are available. But what that means is only 1.9 pe tests per 300 people. Mm -hmm. That's not a lot. That's, That's basically not. two for every 300 people. So for every one positive test, there's probably five or six people walking around with the coronavirus that don't know it. So what the algorithm that us as physicians were given is to try to capture that 15% that are severe and super at high risk mm -hmm. and forgetting the vectors and the people who are transmitting it. Like we're not testing those people. We're testing according to the availability of the test kits versus what I feel is right, which is everybody deserves a test. Oh wow. Because we need to figure out who's the transmitter, who is the 80% who has a simple cold, but they're still giving it to people, and who are the 15% that have it severe. We need to know both. Yeah. And right now, we are only capturing the people who are severe because they're saying that you have to have the symptoms of fever, shortness of breath, and a cough, all of those. Plus, you have to be over 65 with chronic illness in healthcare been traveling the last 14 days to a hot spot or been exposed to someone that is positive COVID confirmed. Wow. So you need the symptoms and the, the high risk. You need okay. both. Wow. So that's why a lot of people who likely have it aren't getting tested and they're just told to stay home. That's another thing. There is no cure unless you're having shortness of breath and need a ventilator. You need to stay home so that you're not um, transmitting it to other people. Well, what about sneezing? Is that a problem? Is that a symptom? That is a symptom, cough and sneezing. Sneezing is more so allergies. Yeah. Usually with an allergy, you won't, you won't get a fever, but a lot of people are having allergies on top of virus, on top of flu, on top of something else. Right. So you'll have coughing and sneezing. So just because you cough because of coronavirus and then you sneeze because of the pollen, you're still passing on droplets and you're still passing it. Ooh, wait, well, I might be asking a really crazy question, but should we be kissing our partners? Should we be having sex? A lot of people ask this question. I would say if, if you have been quarantined together and you are together and you've been together for the last two to three weeks, right? I would say that you can continue doing as you have been and work on intimacy with your partner and your family. But if you're, you know, basically like me, haven't seen my partner in two or three weeks, right. we'll probably stay apart during until the pandemic comes down. Because I don't know if I have it. I'm more at high risk because I have been seeing patients all through January, February, and the beginning of March. Yeah. A lot who, who appeared to possibly have because they had those type of symptoms. Okay. Okay. So, wow. This is crazy. Woo. So <laughs> what about the drive through testing? I know that South Korea has that system set up. Do you, are we going to get that soon or what? Up? That is the hope, but you would need to make the test kits. So we have to wait for manufacturers to make the test kits. And even still then, you can't just drive through. You have to call a hotline for your insurance or for your physician who goes through those, that algorithm that I just gave you, mm -hmm. having the symptoms and the high-risk exposure. And then the physician will write you a prescription to go get the COVID testing that you are one of those people who we need to capture. Um, other than that, you can drive through all you want. You need to drive by because they're not doing anything for you. <laughs> well, okay. So it, it pretty much, it just says that everybody's at risk at a whole and you just need to stay. 100% of people are at risk. That's for the Okay. <laughs> that's, that's a lot to take in. I mean, I know that we've been kind of messaging each other back and forth and I appreciate you doing that in the group, but it's just like been kind of mind boggling that this is really happening. And a lot of people are thinking this is the end of the world and they're going crazy. And honestly, you know, I, from a spiritual standpoint, from the Bible, and I know we don't want to go into that, but at the same time, it is kind of close. So it's kind of bringing so much fear into people. And I'm not gonna lie, I freaked out at first because I was like, 
Woo! I was thinking about my family. I was thinking about my loved mm-hmm. ones more than myself. Mm-hmm. I'm not, I wasn't being selfish like, oh my God, I'm going to die. No, 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 no. I was thinking about the people that are, I love the most. How can it be affected? And then if you see them doing this and you see them doing that, you get upset, you start to panic without even knowing it. So fear is a factor in the United States right now. What can we do to kind of calm that down? I think we need to stop the fear because the fear actually makes you more at risk. Yes. When you have fear, it stresses you out and you release cortisol and that decreases your immune system and the ability to fight it in the first place. Right. So we need to be getting sleep. You need to put yourself in bed between eight and 10 hours mm-hmm. because sleep is mentally and physically restorative. Take mm-hmm. your supplements, stay hydrated and love on your loved ones. Yes. So it also, also just depends on the angle that you choose. You could choose to love on your loved ones out of fear because you're afraid of losing them, Mm -hmm. or you can just become in consciousness, realize, hey, anything can happen at any time, and I need to love on my loved ones because tomorrow is not promised, but not because of the fear that tomorrow is going to end, but because of the love and the affirmation that now I'm conscious, you know what? This is now in my conscious where I'm very, very aware it is time to love on my loved ones because tomorrow is not promised. It's the angle that you choose. Yeah, that's really good. That's real. What should we do psychologically to prepare for the next stage of this virus? I would say if people, if you need to get an energy healer, like our friend Monica Bay, uh, or <laughs> yes, or or therapists, um, there's a there's something called EAP employee uh, employee assessment programs. Yes. So for my hospital system, I would get eight free sessions every single year. So may tap into that. Mm -hmm. So tap into your resources, energy healing, therapy. I would say that if you're able to, you know, if somebody, if you live in a home, going into your backyard and spending some time in nature, not, you know, in the presence of other human beings, but spending time in nature, nature is your number one neutralizer. Um, I would say also make social media and TV your servant and not your master. A lot of people are so manic that they are updating their feed on social media every two seconds. And then on TV that you are so stuck in the electromagnetic frequency that you don't come back to neutral. And of course, you're going to make yourself stressed out and anxious. So being calm is not something that naturally happens. It is something that you have to assertively choose to do. Mm. You have to assertively go in the backyard and, and be aware of this is grass or this is, this is a leaf and that's a tree and go hug it, you know? You have to be assertive about taking a bath and, and meditating when you're taking a bath and taking deep breaths. To be assertive about now I'm doing like 25 minute workouts in my living room a couple times a week because when you exercise, there was a study at Johns Hopkins that you're able to get into deep sleep 40% more of the time. Nice. when you exercise your sleep is improved by 40 percent. so like self-care self-care is health care take care of yourself yes. and don't rely on the medical community because we are trying to take care of that 15 percent. so the 75 percent of you 85 percent of you need to take care of yourself and stay out of stay from away from each other and stay out of the hospital yeah you think you have it and you don't have the respiratory distress you need to stay home there's no cure for you we yeah. treat symptoms and while you're out and about trying to find if you have it or not, you're not going to get the test most likely and you went and spread it. So stay home. Yeah. That's like so real. Thank you for being so real and candid because I think that a lot of people are just kind of beating around the bush and are not really telling us what's going on. So I want to know one more thing, like how ready is the U.S. for this? You know, do you think the U.S. is ready for what we're about to see? I honestly didn't think we were were going to think that it was as big as it has gotten. And we are projected to be, you know, pretty close to on par with how Italy happened, but on a bigger scale because we're a bigger country. Wow. Um, I think we're just going to have to do our part to keep up. I do think it is going to hit the fan in two to four weeks. And then if we continue staying in quarantine and protecting ourselves, then it will start to taper off because I'm hoping that it is a seasonal virus, and then we'll recover. Um, There'll be a lot of recover, physical, emotional, economically. Yeah. Now, who are you worried about the most? I'm worrying about the people who deserve to live but will die because we have to choose. 
the more so once they pass away the only people who suffer are the loved ones that are left behind so i'm worried about my patients and and my friends and family who may have to deal with the grief of someone that they truly loved passing away that didn't have to if they had gotten sick two months ago or three or four months in the future if they had just gotten sick at a better time period that they would have had care that they deserved mm. so i'm worried about those people i'm also worried about those that are um, economically struggling and really don't know where their next meal or their next paycheck or how they're going to take care of themselves just for their basic needs that's true yeah who i'm worried about i'm you know i know we're not supposed to talk about who we help but you know i saw this guy on the side you know on a sidewalk just holding a sign up and he looked like a really normal older guy and he was saying look i'm i'm not homeless but i'm hungry i don't have any money and i gave him my last cash in my in my wallet i mean of course we had more at home or whatever but i had it in my wallet and i i just busted out crying because I was like, is this what the economy is about to look like? I mean, do you think that a lot of people are about to be put out on the streets? Let's, let's be honest. Let's talk about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think. Huh. My yes. heart just went heavy. I don't know why I did that. I've given to so many people. But in that moment, Barbara, I was like, whoo, it just hit home. Like, this is real. This is getting real, you know? So how many people will be put out because of the economy? This is kind of crazy. I don't know. Um, I'm not in a, um, that, but it's going to be a lot. I, I've already heard, you know, through a lot of family and friends that probably 60% of, you know, the, the U S non-essential, they are, people are facing, um, losing their jobs. Wow. They're facing that. So unless you have family members or a spouse who can cover both of you and is essential in the workforce, we're dealing with a lot of turmoil. Well, you know what? We're going to continue that the country, we all unite collectively and we become one conscious and we continue to pray. That's all we can do is keep the faith. And I want you to give us prayer and smart. Yes, smart. There you go. Thank and you. Smart and pray. I, exactly. Exactly. So leave us with some encouraging words. What ignites you to keep doing what you're doing today? Because I mean, you have to be in the front line. You have to be in front of all these people that are infected mostly, you know, what keeps you going? What keeps me going is that this was, this was my passion. And this is why I was put on earth was to help other people, um, emotionally and physically. So that, that encompasses the whole person. And so in different time periods, I'll be helping people more physically with how I take care of them symptomatically, whether that be through prescriptions or through whatever, or, um, or education on nutrition and different supplements that they can take versus there are time periods when I'm led to, I sit and I, sometimes I pray with my patients and sometimes I take extra time and put a little extra sauce on it because they may not have somebody in their life that speaks that, that into them. And I also know the, the weight of who I am in society as a physician, that my words, they have more weight than most just because of my education and who I am in society. Right. And so I take that very, very seriously, that my social media platform and the things that I say, how I present myself is always for education and always uplifting. I try to be, yeah. Well, Dr. Barbara, we appreciate you again. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being on. I know you're busy, but thank you for taking the time out to educate our community because they need to know they need you and we need you. The world needs you. And we just want to say thank you so much. We're so grateful for you, what you do. It's my pleasure. Thank you for um, seeking me out. And it was my honor to be on. And um, we have perfect timing. I'll start my telemedicine in a couple minutes. I can hear my uh, medical assistant out there talking to patients and getting anything set up for me. It's my honor. Awesome. Well, have a great day and we love you. I'm going to keep you in my deepest prayers, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.